Greetings. You're watching this video because you've got a Miata. NA, NB, 1.6, 1.8, doesn't matter. You've got one of these things. And you adjusted the idle without looking at the service manual. You just looked at the throttle assembly and you just said, oh, I know what to do. Just move that, boom, done. Got the idle up a little bit, sweet. But it's not idling correctly. You turn the air conditioner on, assuming you still have a working AC, and the throttle speed, or the engine speed dips a little bit, and then slowly rises up again. And you're like, well, that's not right. Or it just idles weird. Too high, too low, just not right. So you go on the forums and you're like, hey, I need to, I adjusted my idle and oh my God. And then you see the dreaded post and you start seeing it repeat and repeat and repeat. What screw did you use to adjust the idle? And you say, oh, I use this screw right here because that's what the throttle or the, uh, yeah, that's what the throttle rests against. I mean, why not just change the, it worked on my lawnmower. Well, why wouldn't it work on, you know, it's a car or whatever, you know. And then you get the symphony of responses. I regret to inform you. That, that is the no touch screw. That is your Miata's no, no special place. And touching that is akin to violating your engine. You now need to walk the walk of shame to the auto recycling yard or to your dealer or wherever you get your parts and you need to buy a new throttle body. Okay, no one's ever really said that. But if you ask the dealer or you ask a, a Mazda technician, hey, how do I adjust that screw? They're all going to give you the same damn answer. There are no adjustments for that screw, son. Sorry, you're never supposed to touch that screw. It is set at the factory by specially trained, highly, highly technically minded individuals at the Mazda factory in Hiroshima, Japan, using specialized equipment. And by touching that screw, you done fucked up. Okay, fair enough. And then you're like, well, now what? <laughs> I'm not going to spend $400 on a new throttle body. And I'm not going to buy a used throttle body because chances are somebody else did the same damn thing before scrapping their car. And then you're wandering in the desert lost looking for answers. And you Googled how to adjust my, uh, Miata no touch screw or how to adjust throttle stop screw, which is the correct term, Mazda Miata. And you landed on my video, and here we are. And you're looking at me thinking, will this guy just shut up and give me the answers? Yes, I will. I will. But this is my video on my channel, and I'm giving you free information that I Googled and found for free. So, you gotta put up with me, I'm sorry. Gotta love me. So I may or may not be the individual who did exactly that. I touched the no, no special touch screw. Wait, the no, no touch screw. That's, that, that is the, that is the, 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 the actual, that in the book, that's what it says. No, no touch. Seriously though, this screw is adjusted at the factory and is not intended to be field adjustable. The dealers do not have the adjust. Well, they actually, it turns out they do. Um, a little more on that in a second. So let's do this. I'm going to draw out a complete scenario. I just did this to my car. So I'm going to walk you through what you need, how to do it. It's pretty self-explanatory once you see all this. I'm not taking my car apart for the video. Sorry, not doing it. I just put it back together again, and I'm happy with the results. So let's talk about what I did. Two things were out of adjustment on my car. <clears throat> the throttle position sensor 
and the no-no adjustment screw, okay? This throttle stop screw, let's use it for, use the correct term for now, it's, okay. The throttle stop screw is a reference point for the adjustment of the uh, throttle position sensor. In order to get the throttle position sensor correctly adjusted, this has to be correctly adjusted. Without any adjustment specs, what do you do? Okay, here's the article I found, and you can look this up yourself if you want to look it over and uh, peruse it. It's MA007. It's a Mazda reference guide. This is, this is dealer level stuff. Um, and I'm going to read to you the paragraph on the throttle position sensor adjustment. Okay. Proper throttle position sensor and idle airflow adjustment depend on the factory setting of the throttle adjustment screw. That's the no-no touch screw. If the screw has been adjusted in previous attempts to set idle speed, <laughs> we all know how that happened, throttle position sensor adjustment may be incorrect. This may lead to problems such as stalling, low cold, idle, hard initial shift into drive or reverse, high emissions, and other related symptoms. Inspect the throttle adjustment screw, referring to figure MA007-1. If the factory applied paint, usually white or yellow, is broken, it is possible that the screw is no longer in proper adjustment. This may require a replacement of the throttle body. Nah, we're talking serious cash here. Over what, really? However, technicians have had success resetting the screw with the following procedure. And this is the answer. Miata is always the answer, but when it's not, this is the answer. Okay, remove the intake, step one. Step two, get yourself a set of feeler gauges. I went to three auto parts stores to find one. Now you need a one thousandth of an inch feeler gauge. Good luck finding one in America. I couldn't, I found this one. This is, uh, this is the one I found. One of these. So you got to look at the back of the card when you're in the store. You're not going to find a one thousandth. I'm already, I'm just going to spoiler alert it for you. You can get one. Um, you can get one online. Yes, you can get one online. Um, you can actually get a long one, one thousandth of an inch uh, feeler gauge. And um, for the sake of the demonstration of this video, let's pretend that this is a, Okay, the smallest I could find in the stores is one and a half thousandths. Not, not really the right one, but it'll work. Um, so if you find a one and a half thousandths, that's close enough. It worked for me, hooked on phonics. Um, so what you're gonna do is that one thousandths of an inch is flexible enough to fit into the into the bore. You're going to slide it in, you're going to slightly crack open the uh, throttle plate, you're going to stick the feeler gauge in, and you're going to gently close the throttle plate on the feeler gauge. And you're going to feel that throttle, or that, that feeler gauge. It should snugly be able to be slid back and forth uh, without, without bending. Um, it should very easily just you should be able to push it in and pull it just ever so slightly. It needs to be snug in the bore, but it, it you don't want it cramped down on it. You also don't want it to be, you know, loose as a goose. So you're gonna loosen up this uh, lock nut here, and you're gonna get yourself a. Um, let's see what size Allen key did we use? I think I would have this stuff all ready for you, right? You're gonna use, I believe it was a. Uh, two and a half millimeter Allen key. It's metric, so get a metric Allen key set. Should have it what you need. And you're going to very ever so slightly. You're going to adjust the position of the stop screw while manipulating that feeler gauge. Just get it just so. I could demonstrate this, but I don't want to tear my car apart. And again, trust me, if you can read this and you can want you'll figure it out you're smart um don't 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 knock yourself down you're smart enough to do this you, you got this once you have this adjusted then it's time to check and adjust if necessary the um 
throttle position sensor. Okay, this is the hard part. So once we have our reference point set, we can now recheck and adjust, if necessary, the throttle position sensor. On the 1994 and later models, and the rest of the uh, model years are included in the Haynes book, um, you're going to want to get a 12 thousandths feeler gauge and stick it between the throttle plate, um, or the throttle stop screw, and the throttle mounting bracket here. Stick it right there, and I'll demonstrate. This is not a 12 thousandths uh, feeler gauge, but we're going to stick it in there for. Um, this is how I did mine. Is just throw it right in there and just kind of let the feeler gauge rest, making sure that it's not providing a bias uh, to our to our measurement here. You're going to then check the bottom two two contacts here on this connector, the four pin connector, the bottom two. You're going to check them for continuity. They should be, uh, I believe, wide open. So no continuity. And actually, no. No, I have that backwards. There should be continuity with a 12 thousandths feeler gauge. So you should be able to tone these two out with a multimeter. And then you're going to take a you're going to take the 12 thousandths out, and you're going to put a 16 thousandths feeler gauge. Now, with a 16 thousandths feeler gauge, there should be continuity. There should be no continuity with a 16 thousandths. So, 12 thousandths closed, 16 thousandths open, open circuit. That is. Okay. The adjustments needed to the throttle position sensor will be slight, very, very slight. To readjust it, you're going to need a 7 millimeter wrench, and you're going to loosen these two screws with a 7 millimeter wrench. I'll show you the one that I'm using, and it makes it a little easier because it's a very small um, little guy here. Oh, it doesn't matter. I have one. I saw, oh, is that it? Yeah, this is the one I used. And it just kind of very easy to do. Uh, seven millimeter wrench. We're going to loosen those up ever so slightly. I recommend before adjusting anything. I highly and, and any any mechanic will recommend this. You're going to want to put a score mark so you know where it was. So if you get it way out of whack, you can put it back to where it was. If you cannot make that adjustment, then you might want to double check. But let's say, for example, there is no way in hell that you can get it to adjust to that level of precision. If you can't do that, you either need to replace the sensor or double check your, um, your adjustment on your throttle stop screw. And it's, it's that simple. I mean, these sensors are made pretty well. Um, you shouldn't need a sensor on a low mile car like this. Um, this one's got 60. 5,000 miles on it or 64,000 miles on it. So it shouldn't be a bad sensor, but remember plastics do age and they and they can they can uh, They can shrink and expand over time And that can throw the sensor out of uh, out of the ability of being ever calibrated again. So That's how you adjust the throttle position sensor on a 94 and up and uh, once you get it adjusted you're going to want to tighten those screws up a little bit at a time, double checking, you know, tighten them up a little bit, double check, again, 12 thousandths open, no, 12 thousandths closed, 16 thousandths open, and just keep checking it, keep checking it, tighten it until it's finally snug enough to where it won't back out, and double check it again, because these measurements can drift, or these adjustments can drift as you tighten that that part down. So you want to make sure you tighten it a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit here, a little bit there, just like you're torquing down a head gasket. So the next step, once you've got your throttle position sensor in the correct position, um, you want to check your timing and your idle speed. And to do that, you're going to want to short out on your diagnostic port. Now this is apply this applies to 94 and 95 maybe 96. I believe 97 it's done a little bit differently and can't be done in the field. But on the 94s, you just crack open your diagnostic port connector and you're going to get a piece of wire and you're going to short out 
10 to ground. That's this connector here, where my thumbnail is, to ground to there. What that's going to do is it's going to tell the CPU not to intervene with idle speed. It's going to then use whatever base idle speed is set. Okay, so the engine could stall. If your idle speed is out of whack, your engine could potentially stall. So once you've got the engine started, assuming it stays running, you're gonna to wanna to go ahead and hook up your timing light with a tachometer. You can rent these, you can buy them. I bought one for a hundred bucks, I'll probably never use it again, whatever. Um, so you're gonna hook up your timing light. Now you're gonna say, well, how do I do that? My battery's in the trunk. Not too fret. There is a positive connector port right here. Take this cap off. You're going to hook your positive lead on your timing light to this. And your ground. Well, I ground it to the engine block, but you can ground it anywhere you want. As long as that thing lights up and is happy, you're fine. This little guy is a little crystal type thing. I don't know how it works exactly. This one looks like a magnetic. This one's magnetic. An inductive coil, I think. I think it's an induction coil. Whatever the hell it is, um, you're going to want to hook this guy right up to your number one spark plug lead, which is the one in the very front. And it's going to start flashing and showing you some numbers. It's going to show you the engine speed. Now, on this car, because of how the ignition system works, I believe it I believe it sparks either every revolution or every other revolution. So, wait. No, it, it sparks every revolution. So, bang, 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 bang. What you want to do is whatever that, whatever, whatever that panel reads. In this case, it was reading 2,000 RPM at 1,000 of actual RPM. You just cut that number in half. Your target number is 800 RPM, 800 to 850 uh, RPM. I set mine to like 810 maybe. And once you, uh, once you have that all set up, you can go ahead and adjust your idle speed the correct way with this screw right here. The ECU is going to let you, it's just saying, hey, take me. You've disabled me, so I'm at your wit's end. At your wit. I'm at your mercy. No, wait. Eh, anyway, whatever. <laughs> the ECU is just going to let you do what you got to do. So you can adjust it to your heart's content using a timing light. But if you don't have a timing light with a, with a, a tachometer readout, that's okay. You can use the car's tachometer if you so choose to do so. Um, you're going to want to put it, and I'll show you on my tach. You're going to want to put it right about that hash mark below the 1,000. That's it. Simple stuff. Put it at the hash mark below a thousand. That's all you gotta do. Um, but I choose to I chose to go with the precision of a of an actual timing light with a readout. So what I did is I set my target to 850, which was about 1600 on the readout. Or no, 800, which is 1600 on the readout. And I cranked this, slowly cranked the screw out until the desired idle speed was reached. Then, you're not done. Now you want to check your timing, your ignition timing. Oh yes, ignition timing is critical. And for that, I'm going to suggest you find a YouTube video showing how to time an engine. But it's very simple. Your timing marks are right down there. You can, you can see them at this angle right here. Down on, the, uh, down on the harmonic balance, there's going to be two marks. I forget what the I forget what the, the second one is, but there's two marks, and you want the timing to be at um, I think it's 10 degrees before top dead center or something like that. You can you can play with timing. You can adjust it up and down based on what works for you. But there's a range you want to keep it in. It's uh, the range is actually in this book here, and uh, no, it's not. The Haynes manual does not discuss timing. Um, let me see. I'm going to look it up on my phone. All right. For our next uh, demonstration, I'm going to actually, I'm actually going to do this, and I'm going to kind of walk you through the process. We're going to set the ignition timing. I've already done this on this car, but it's better to, so you can see what I'm seeing. 
So the timing light I'm using as a digital readout for TAC. Um, I bought this because I wanted a precise um, measurement for my uh, my idle and uh, my idle adjustment mainly. So the next thing you're going to want to do before we get into timing is set our idle speed. So now that you've got your reference point set, you've got your your um, throttle position sensor select uh, uh, positioned correctly, and everything's good and hunky dory over here. You want to get the car warmed up. Just let it run for a while until the, the temperature needle bumps off the uh, the peg, and, and get it idled down. You're going to want to shut it off, and you're going to want to jump 10 to ground. What does that mean? Okay, the diagnostic port is right here. Here is your 10. This little guide right back there. 10. That's this pin right here where my thumbnail is, and then ground right here. Okay, you're going to want to use a short piece of wire. I actually had one that I had cut for this. This doesn't, this is too thick. I tried that. Maybe I put it over here. Yeah, it's just a short piece. It's actually a bread tie. <laughs> so we're going to use this. And what this is going to do is it's going to tell the ECU to cool your jets. I'm adjusting timing. I'm looking at things. I'm adjusting idle speed. Leave me alone. Don't intervene. Just, just, just roll with it, and uh, that's what it's for. It just tells the ECU to to go into basically diagnostic mode. Well, not entirely, but whatever. For the sake of this conversation, that's what we're going to call it. Okay, we're going to get the car started up. We're going to have our timing light hooked up, and uh, that's pretty straightforward. On the Miata, batteries in the trunk, so there is no positive terminal. But there's a little connector right here, a little blue connector, and it's got a, a positive, 12-volt uh, um, positive connector in it. We're just going to clip this right into that, and we're just going to ground that to the uh, to that chassis. So I've got my spark plug lead pickup hooked up, and nothing is in the way of the fans or the belts. Let's start the engine. We're going to warm it up. And here's another very interesting thing I just learned. Because it's in diagnostic mode, the cooling fans are essentially disabled. They might be enabled so if it really gets hot, but the fans won't turn on until you get it out of idle. Watch this. As soon as I pull up on this throttle cable, the fans automatically kick in, both of them. Pretty cool, huh? So that feature won't work if your throttle position sensor is out of adjustment little fun fact. So if that works, if the fans are blowing full bore, then you're out of adjustment. So, we're going to let the engine warm up a bit though. Actually, we should probably take that uh, and just let it run normally for a little bit. Reach, to, reach operating temperature. So right now, our, um, our idle speed is a little on the low side. But because it's cold and the ECU is not adjusting for it, we're going to give it a pass. Another thing to look out for is make sure all accessories are turned off. Radio, heat, lights, every as much as you can. My stereo, when it's off, it looks like that. It's drawing very little power. And the justification behind that, oh, and the steering has to be center. We don't want any load on the alternator or the Really anything. You don't want any additional loads on the motor. Okay, this thing's uh, pretty warm. Looks like our idle speed could be raised a wee bit. So, 850 RPM times 2. We're going to set it to... I'll do 825. We'll divide it down the middle. 1650 is our desired our desired engine speed. So what we're going to do is we're going to grab ourselves a screwdriver and we're going to raise the engine idle speed, the base idle speed, to 1650. And we're going to do that by threading this out ever so slightly. Sixteen, six 
60. That's about right. I think it's a good place for it. Now we're going to check our timing. Now this next part might be tricky on camera. The engine's warm, the idle speed is 1660. It's about where it needs to be. So we're going to go ahead and look at our timing. This is going to be hard on camera, but I'm going to try my best. So we're going to zoom in. You're going to see the two timing marks. I see them both right there. All right, the first one, oh, that does not look right at all. Looking at it right now. All right, I just double checked my facts and I'm right. Okay, so this is this is how the timing marks work out. There's two timing marks. You can barely see them on camera, but they're there, I swear. Let's see if I can zoom it on. Uh, all right, it won't focus, but that's fine. So you're gonna see two marks on a 94. Other years may vary. Let's see if we can get this to focus. I can't get it to focus. All right, the bottom hash mark is your top dead center. Now, you'll notice that there was one, like, it looks like there's a mark on it. See that one right there? It looks like there's a white paint mark on it. That's 10 degrees before top dead center. Okay? You want to make sure that it's set to 10 degrees before top dead center. The second mark on the, on the on, so the first mark, that's going to line up with TDC. The second mark behind it, that's the that's the ignition trigger mark, and that's the one you got to worry about. So the one of the the one that's going to be forward of that mark is top dead center. That's going to line up the top dead center. So the factory recommended adjustment is already there for you. Okay. Sound good? All right. So once you've confirmed your timing is correct at the correct idle speed with the correct throttle position adjustment with the correct <laughs> with the correct throttle stop, it all links in. You notice how one of those if one of those uh, items is not done in the correct order, you're never going to have an engine that runs right. And some of those adjustments, the um, oh I should have mentioned, and I didn't. Uh, I it spaced me. Space my mind, um, but let's say you let's say your timing is um, a little advanced or retarded, as they say. That is the correct term. It's not a slur in this uh, scenario. Um, on the 94s, actually, it's, it's similar to all uh, the 90, 90 to I think 97 are very similar. Um, but you've got this guy right here, this right here. This is your camshaft position sensor, not crankshaft position and the crankshaft position sensor is what triggers the ECU to create spark which is why on the ignition system on the because it only uses a reference point from one camshaft it, it has a waste spark system so it ignites every engine revolution it'll spark every revolution and that's why you have to divide the measurement that the tachometer gives you or the the uh, timing gun in half and if you divide it in half you'll have an accurate reading so you have to loosen I believe there's a bolt on the back of here you got to loosen that bolt just a little bit so that you can rotate this whole assembly forward and back and again you'll see there's a couple of scratch marks that I put on there when I bought the car, the timing was actually retarded by two degrees. So it kind of threw everything a little off. I'm not the first person to have my fingers in this engine. So, you know, there's a lot of things that were messed with like that that were not done correctly. So my job is to make it correct. Now, the next thing I'm going to do, because I'm actually having a problem with this car, which is what started all of this. Starting last fall, uh, the engine started to buck when cold or warm. Cold or lukewarm, like a warm start. And what would happen is on acceleration, it would misfire. A couple, of, And it feels to me 
like an ignition misfire. So my plan is to investigate that a little bit. But I don't want to start buying parts until I know everything is where it needs to be. Once the car warms up, it's been running for a little bit, it's totally fine. But when it's cold, it, it, it just doesn't run right. It has a little bit of a hesitation. So something isn't right. I actually bought a coolant temperature sensor. This is a dealer part. I only use dealer. When it comes to a sensor, I only use factory parts. And I don't buy them on eBay because I don't know if it's a repackaged factory part or if it's a knockoff. And when it comes to things like sensors, <laughs> you don't want to put the cheapest thing on the market out there in your engine. You can do what you want. I do what I do, you do what you do. Um, you know, but this is not a very easy part to replace. Well, it's easy, but it's you got to drain down the cooling system a little bit, and you've got to remove the coil pack assembly, and it's accessible right right down there. Uh, it's in the back of the motor. Good place for it. Uh, but anyway, I bought that because my initial thought after driving it a little bit and kind of examining when it happens. I, for, let, me, let me just preface this by saying, I, at this point, I do not believe I need that sensor. But I figured, what the hell, I'll just have one on hand in case I need it. Um, I believe the issue is ignition-related, and I'm going to start by pulling out my spark plugs and uh, checking the gap and checking the condition. The plugs are probably 13,000 miles old, maybe, if that. So they shouldn't be worn, but I'm going to double check the gap on all of them to make sure it's correct. There's a possibility, however remote, that I might have a failing coil. Um, it, it feels an ignition misfire is usually pretty precise. Um, I've had all the injectors tested, flow tested, and they all came back with clean bill of health. So I don't believe I have a stuck injector. I couldn't rule that out either, but... I don't believe it's a stuck injector. Nor do I believe it's a coolant temperature sensor. I'm just gonna replace the sensor because I have one. What the hell? Okay, I checked this spark plug gap. This is the number one, and I checked the gap, and it was exactly 40 thousandths where it should be. Um, I can't really zoom in very well, but it looks every bit as normal as the photo. So, yeah, I think it's okay. There's no need to do anything to it. Um, I mean, the tip looks... These aren't platinum plugs, and that tip looks a little melted, but... I would say it's perfectly healthy. Nothing wrong with it. And these are uh, the, the correct NGK plugs. BK, R, F, U, K. I don't know what's going on there. BK, R, 5, E, G, P. And uh, yeah, they're, they're in good shape. Nothing wrong with them. Nothing at all. Okay, and the number two plug looks just like the first one. I put anti-seize on these. That's why you see little bits of shiny flex. It's exactly like the first one, no cracks or anything crazy. Cool. You got another winner. This one's got nothing, nothing wrong at all. Looks pretty good. Yep. You know, this uh, license plate. <laughs> oh man, how prophetic that was. I took out the number three and things look good. Took out the number four and uh, wow, totally perfect. All right, so the issue I'm having is not plugs. It's not plugs, it's not timing. It's not throttle position sensor. It's not any of those things. Could be coils. So at this stage of the game, we've eliminated a lot of things that could potentially cause a misfire under load when cold. 
So we're gonna do a quick little timeline jump here. Um, I am replacing the coolant temperature sensor really just to eliminate it as a possibility. Um, and throughout the process, I thought it would be probably beneficial to kind of document some of this. So let's get into it. So you wanna remove your coil pack. Um, here's mine. And if you look at how the coil pack is built, this little rubber stopper, this goes against the firewall. There's a bottom bolt with a bushing. And that's kind of allows it to swing free for some reason. You want to remove the two top bolts, which go into the valve cover. And you want to reach on the passenger side, reach down in there, and you want to get this one. Okay. Oops. So once we're down in the, down inside. I'm going to take a look around. Oh, look, there's our water temperature sensor right there, that little green plug. Now, I'm going to wipe this oil off here. This car had a leaky valve cover gasket when I bought it. I changed it out three years ago, and you can still see some residue of oil back there. We're going to kind of clean it up a little bit. But that's just all, that's all it is. It's oil. It's not coolant. If we had a coolant leak, we would want to fix it right now. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, we're going to have to drain down the cooling system a little bit because we want to get that plug off. And uh, this just threads in. Now, looking around, I don't see another sensor. I think that sensor does two different things on the 94s. Normally you'd have a one wire sensor, but that could be actually, that could be mounted somewhere else around there. So what we gotta do now is we gotta drain the cooling system. And you don't have to drain it all the way, but because we're here and all the stuff's set up, I'm gonna just drain it down because I'm gonna change my coolant. I changed it last three years ago. So why not just do it? What the hell? So I'm gonna get a drain pan set up and I'm gonna drain my radiator. There's a drain cock at the bottom of it. I don't even think I need to remove the splash shield, but let's get it all set up. The drain is right in the middle. Accessible. Just take a screwdriver, flathead screwdriver. Unscrew that plug. It's right in the middle. There's a hole in the splash shield for it. So you don't even need to take the splash shield off. They made it easy. Take your radiator cap off. Uh, the coolant is pretty cool, uh, pretty clean. And there it goes. I'm just gonna let it drain, and then I'm gonna replenish the coolant once the sensor is replaced. Easy peasy. Interestingly enough, the new sensor didn't come with a new ring, a new seal, so I'm gonna have to go get one. Not a big deal. I'll just run to the parts store. Um, but yeah, you do need to put a seal on that. This is an aluminum crush washer. Um, it was covered in a little bit of uh, smudge, but um, otherwise not bad. Connector looks good. Now, these are probably not the same temperature, but I want to get a baseline reading. I want to read both for resistance before I put the new one in. Let's just see what it looks like. So while I could have used the original seal, I decided to just buy a couple of uh, assorted ones. And... Um, this way, I don't have to reuse it. But they don't have the exact one. They have, you know, some very similar ones, but like I might not get the outer diameter right, but the inner diameter should be okay. Let's see how this one looks. That's not too bad. The original one. I mean, yeah, these can be used, you know, once or twice. But uh, I don't like to reuse them because, you know, they've been crushed down once. And they're not that expensive. But if you can't find the original one, <laughs> I guess. I'm going to use this one here. It's aluminum, so it's the same material. It just seems a little loose. How about this copper one? Let's see how this one looks. too small. Yeah, it's a little too small, so those are useless. No. 
I think what I'm gonna do, I think what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna use the factory. Um, or no, I'll use this one right here. That should do it. All right, let's take a quick look at the. Um, so I'm gonna angle the camera so that you can see what's going on with the multimeter. And I'm gonna measure both um, the new and the old sending units for uh, resistance. And um, this will help us determine if it was good or bad. Now, my theory, my theory is that the sensor was totally fine. And we're just doing this uh, just for the sake of replacing sen you know, a sensor that's not even bad in the first place. Okay. The book just tells you to look for an open or shorted circuit. That's how you're supposed to test the sensor. The problem is getting to the sensor is so hard that I just figured, what the hell, I don't want to do this again. I'm just going to tear it out and put in a new one. That's just how I roll. So let's just test the old one first. I've let these both sit on the same workbench to acclimate to the temperature a little bit. And that's that. So here we go. 2.286765432180 and falling. All right. The new one What do we got here? So I don't know what the range is from good to bad, but I will look that up on Google real quick and see. 2.1334567, and it settles down right about there. And they're both the same ambient temperature. They've been sitting on the bench for about half an hour now. So I'm going to say that uh, the original one was actually good. You're going to get some variance. There's a, there's, a, there's a range that they need to fall in. On, uh, under different temperature circumstances, but in this case, I think the old one was just fine. So we're going to put the new one in anyway because we have it. There it is. I'm going to shoot a little deoxid gold into these connectors as I put them back together again. I just feel like it couldn't hurt. So we'll start with this green guy. If there's anything left in the can, of course. I'll just spray a little bit of stuff in there. I'm using a three-quarter inch wrench, by the way, to tighten it up. Um, I don't have anything in the metric size uh, that'll fit, so I gotta gotta use what I got. You know what I mean? That's what I got. That's what I'm using. And this connector. How the hell does it go on? Is it the right connector? Oh no. Is it the wrong one? Nope. <laughs> Had me going there for a sec. Now these two go to the, uh, the coil pack. So they have to be accessible. I'm going to spray inside those as well. This just keeps the... Uh, if there's any degradation on the contacts... Empty. Oh well. Oh well. It'll be fine. We don't really need that, but I had some, so I figured, well, use it, right? When God gives you deoxid, use it. You'll notice that I loosened up the um, the vacuum pipe going to the booster because that makes getting the coil in and out so much easier. It's hard enough to remove as it is. Why make it any harder? So here's the coolant that came out. You can see it's a little, uh, it's darkened a little bit. Okay, so right now there's no coolant. I got it all reassembled, coil packs are back in, everything's reconnected. Um, I found something. I found there's a little tear in this vacuum line that just might go through to the inside of the line. I don't know at this point, but I'm gonna go ahead and, yeah, I think it goes through. So there's a vacuum leak. That is a, uh, what is that? 
That's the fuel pressure regulator, I believe. So that could be something right there. So if that fuel pressure regulator is um, tripping out, uh, there might be something there. Okay, let's get some coolant in this car. And, uh, yeah. I think at this point the auto parts stores are all closed, so I won't be able to get my vacuum hose today, but I can get it tomorrow. No big deal. Alright. Alright, we've got to get some coolant in here. Nice, fresh. I put the plug back in. Make sure you do that. Bad news bears if you don't. Mm. So I burped the cooling system a little bit. Filled it back up. Now we're going to drain the reservoir with a siphon and then we'll replace that cooling as well. But that was nice and snappy. That's a good thing. I do wonder about this uh, little hose here. I didn't know any better. I say that was a leak. So, we get that changed out. I'm going to let it reach temperature and then we're going to check the levels again. Alright, well that's not normal. I'll have to look into what going, what's going on there. It looks like we shorted out the uh, temperature sensor for the, uh, <laughs> for the dash readout. <sighs> oh well. Because this could happen to you, I want to show you what happened. So I noticed as soon as I turned the ignition switch on, temperature gauge pegged. Clearly that's an implausible reading. That is not accurate. Um, this engine would be glowing <laughs> if it were really that hot. Here's what happened. The temperature gauge on the 94 to 97 is right, the temperature gauge uh, sending unit is right here. Let's get some light on that. It is actually right You'll see it down on this side of the block. Where is it? I can't. Because there's casting shadows here. It's like right about there where my finger's pointing. You'll see it when you see it. It's a single wire sensor. Well, that single wire is right here. It's encased in this insulation. What happened was when I put the coil back, the wire got stuck and was grounding out against that right there. See it? So we got to check that wire for any major damage before I reassemble it. That's what happened to it. So when I torqued down in the coil pack, that wire got in the way, pegged the sensor. Shit happens. No damage would result. If I had left it that way, this is where things can go wrong. If I left it that way, eventually the sensor would, or the gauge would burn out um, from overheating. So don't let that happen. If the wire was severed or cut, the gauge would flatline. It would, it would do nothing. So when you put it back together again, I start the car up and the gauge does nothing then we know for a fact that, uh, you know, the, the wire's cut. But I'm going to check the wire for any obvious damage and um, make repairs if needed. Okay, I think we fixed the short circuit. The wire really wasn't damaged, and it's double-jacketed, so it's fine. Um, but I now I know, where the, I know where the wire is, so if I have to repair it in the future. And now you do, too. Okay, so yeah, it, it somehow got routed during reassembly incorrectly and uh, well it got pinched so when you turn the gauge on it might show warm or nothing at all <laughs> ah shit oh 
let's just see what it does. The wire might be, it might actually be broken, but I didn't, I didn't get that impression. So I might have to, I'm gonna let it warm up a bit and we'll see. Yeah, I, I think it's broken. All right, that was a total false alarm. Uh, looks like the uh, gauge is working properly now. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's at operating temperature. Let's take it for a drive and see what happens. I found some uh, leftover line and uh, vacuum line, and here's what I'm finding. The, the line isn't damaged at all. Well, it is, but it doesn't go through. It's a little nicked, but not enough to cause a vacuum leak. So, but look at the condition this line's in. I mean, it's like new. <laughs> I'm gonna put it back on. I, I so I, I put another section of uh, a vacuum line on here, and I don't need to. It, it's really not necessary. And this isn't as good of a fit as the factory line, so we're gonna put the factory line back on. And that's that, I guess. So we just went for a several hour drive, um, probably we put 125 miles in the car, I think. 150, <laughs> put 150 miles in the car and um, no issues. We did a lot of stopping and starting and warm starting and um, not a hiccup, not a glitch. In fact, this car hasn't run this good since I bought it. Um, it runs better than it's ever driven before. Um, so all I can say is there's a possibility that that sensor was indeed on its way out. It hadn't completely failed. If it completely fails, um, you know, the, the results are pretty obvious. But it could have been on the way, as they say. And by replacing it, I think I fixed the problem. So, if I start it up right now, are the keys in it? No, I gotta put my keys. Hey, bud. This will kind of be the be all end all test um, because it has been sitting for a little bit. And, uh, let's see what we got. the car in a few minutes once the, uh, <clears throat> the sun kind of dips down. Let's see what we get. I think it's fixed. Um, pretty sure. Well, how do you know? What a mess. <laughs> I'm gonna have to do something about that. Um, that's actually oil from when I changed the oil and 
like I spilled some oil everywhere and uh, you can see some of the paint from the calipers but this is a little sensor that uh, turns out just might be no good might not be any good so that's that in a nutshell and uh, now you know so if your car bucks and stalls and hiccups when you're taking off on a warm start maybe change out that sensor um now i did like i said i ordered a bunch of ignition parts um i mean i should probably hang on to them until i really need them really um the copper plugs are only good for thirty thousand miles so there's about a little less than twenty thousand miles left of life and what's in that car now so maybe i'll um maybe i'll wait Maybe I'll wait. But come to think of it, those plugs look like they were platinum tipped. I just thought of that. When I had them out, they looked like they were platinums, but they're not platinums. I didn't pay for platinums. Well, anyway, until next time, <laughs> have a good one.